So Meg? Thank you, Kurt. Thanks very much. Can everybody hear me OK? OK. Um, how many of you have been in a dark enough place to see the sky? A fair fraction. OK, but not where you live, probably, right? You got to drive out in the country or something? Yeah. I think from New Haven, um, you know, we have a student observatory up um, on Edwards Street. And uh, you can probably see the moon, and maybe you could see a planet or two. But you can't see the sky. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the sky. Let me make this uh, nice and dark. OK, we're d I, I won't have all dark uh, for the whole time. But I just want you to be able to see this really well. This is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it is one of the longest exposures ever taken. This one was about 10 days long. Um, almost everything you're looking at is a galaxy. Um, a galaxy consists of about 100 billion stars. And each star is like our sun. So the light you're seeing is, from, is sort of the added up light from the stars. You can't see the individual stars in, the, in those galaxies. They're too far away. But you can see all the starlight. And before, you know, before the world was as populated as it is now, people could go outside and see this kind of thing every night. <laughs> you know, the skies were dark. And I think in those days, people would wonder. I'm going to turn the lights back up in one second. So just hang there. and Yeah, OK. Uh, that's good. And, and so you can, uh, you, can, you can leave them up. It's OK. Um, people used to look at the sky and wonder, you know, what is that stuff? Where is it? Uh, and it often had a, a resonance with the questions like, where did we come from? Today, we're in a different regime where we have uh, very sensitive uh, telescopes and detectors. And we can find out an amazing amount about the universe. It's, in fact, it's, it's mind-boggling how much we know. It's more mind-boggling how much remains to be discovered. So uh, for the students in the audience, this is your job. Okay? I'm, I'm going to tell you today about the discovery of dark energy. But as I'll say at the end, we don't have a clue what this stuff is. It is the dominant constituent of the universe. Most of the universe consists of dark energy. Three quarters of the universe is dark energy. We didn't even know it existed until 1998. And we don't know what it is. And so I think there's a lot of work for scientists. If, you, uh, if you're interested in this subject, there's a lot of work for you uh, in the future. OK. Um, whoops. Sorry, back up. To start, I just want to give you a sense of um, what we know about the universe. We've known for some years that it started as a, as a small point smaller than a, the smaller than an atom. And in the frac tiny fraction of a second, it expanded to about the size of this room in a period called inflation. And then it's been coasting ever since. The universe is expanding. And what I'll tell you about today is how we know it's expanding, okay? and then how that, the study of the expansion of the universe, led us to discover dark energy. And at any time, if there's something you don't understand, please put your hand up and, and, and tell me. Uh, so we can, so I can answer your questions along the way. Um, this cartoon is just supposed to indicate that after this initial bang, the big bang, the universe got very big, and today it's huge and uh, filled with galaxies. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, about this. Before we start, I want to orient you to the scale, the size scale of the universe. The universe is really big. And it's a little hard, well, it's impossible to contemplate, frankly, even for me, but let's try, OK? Um, this is just a drawing. So at the lower right, you see a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope. How many of you recognize that, that it's Hubble? OK. Hubble was launched in 1990, 1990 and is still operating. So it's a pretty um, old by NASA standards. It's about the size of a school bus. This telescope is the size of a school bus. See these two astronauts? Those are humans in spacesuits. It was as big as you could make it and still launch it on the space shuttle. That's, that's what determined how big it was. OK, suppose I multiply the size of the space telescope by a factor of 1 million. OK? 
uh, sorry, Hubble is about 10 meters long. Then I get to a cube that encloses the Earth. In other words, the diameter of the Earth is roughly a million times the size of the space tel telescope. That's 10 to the seventh meters. How many of you study meters in school? Parents, did you study meters? No. Yes? Okay. Um, we were supposed to go to the metric system once, but that was a long time ago. It's hopeless. Okay. So the Earth fits in this 10 million meter box. Now I'm going to multiply by a million again, and I get to the size of the solar system, 10 to the 13th meters, okay, across. Um, that number may not mean that much to you, but you can think of it as light takes about 10 hours to get across the solar system. So sunlight, for example, takes about 10 hours to get out to Pluto, which used to be the most distant planet, and is now is now a planetino or whatever. Okay, multiply now by 10,000 and you get to a box that encloses the nearest few stars. So these are stars that are a few light years from our sun. That's very, very local, okay? Multiply by another factor of 10,000 and you get to the size of our Milky Way galaxy. Our Milky Way galaxy looks something like this. It's a spiral galaxy. Um, it's filled with, as I said, 100 billion stars. We live kind of out in the suburbs. This is, we live out in one of the spiral arms, pretty far from the center of the galaxy. Um, that galaxy is like 100,000 light years across. So if I get on the computer and I'm trying to IM with an alien on the other side of the galaxy, it takes 100,000 years for my signal to get over there. And even if they reply immediately, it's another 100,000 years to get back. So we're not going to, we're not going to be uh, IMing with them. O okay. Pretty big, huh? For someone like me who works on larger scales, this is just totally local neighborhood. This is like your house, maybe, your, maybe the few blocks around your house. Okay, multiply by 100 and you get a box that encloses the nearest few galaxies. There are other galaxies, there are actually billions of galaxies in our universe, and there are a few that are near us, maybe a total of about 50, of which only one is as big as our galaxy. So Andromeda and the Milky Way are the two big shots in our local, local group of galaxies. Okay, one more multiplication by a factor of 1,000, and now we're on the scale of the universe. And my talk today, is about this scale. This, this is sort of 10 billion light years across. So the light from the first galaxies that we can see took 10 billion years to get to us. Okay? Any questions on that? The universe is big. Take, take home lesson number one. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about how we know the universe is expanding. And this is a story that leads to the discovery of dark energy. We can come back and talk about this. It's not like a balloon expanding when you blow it up. Because that is, that's the balloon expanding while space is staying the same, sort of. When I say the universe is expanding, I mean space itself, okay? So if you imagine space, space is completely empty, but you imagine it has sort of a coordinate system on it, the distance between any two points is growing with time. You don't notice that in your daily life, <laughs> because partly because it's uh, not happening near you because other effects are stronger, like gravity. Um, but in our universe, we can observe the effects of this expansion. Okay. Um, we, the way we observe the effects of expansion, I'm going to let you look at this picture too, because it's really pretty. We look at galaxies. So here's a picture where you can very clearly see some big galaxies. Here's a, um, this is a spiral galaxy like ours. This is a, a sort of a disky galaxy. This is a very round galaxy. Here's a weirdo one. You can look at these galaxies and you can measure how, how they're moving with respect to us. This is what astronomers did 100 years ago. And uh, the way they did it was to use a, a technique I'm going to explain in a second uh, about Doppler shifts. 
So I'm going to teach you about the Hubble law. This was determined by Edwin, Edwin Hubble, after whom the telescope is named. And he found that the speed with which galaxies are moving away from us is proportional to their distance. So the nearest galaxies are moving away slowly. The more distant galaxies are moving away much faster. And he concluded that this meant the universe was expanding. And I'm going to explain this whole story to you, OK? So I'm going to explain what the Hubble law is. I'm going to explain how we measure the speed with which a galaxy is moving away. I'm going to tell you how we measure its distance. So far, so good? OK, let's talk about distance. If I had a light bulb, and I know exactly how bright it is, it's 100 watts, say, and I move it two times farther away from me, it should be four times dimmer. It will be four times dimmer. If I move it 10 times farther away, it'll be 100 times dimmer. This is, this is an empirical observation that you can, uh, you can test yourself. It basically means it, uh, that, but it's really easy to understand. If you have light going out in all three dimensions, then you can think of a sort of a shell of light covering a sphere. The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. OK, so, it, so you spread the light over a surface that's 4 pi r squared. So as you go farther and farther out, the surface is bigger. The light is dimmer by that factor of r squared. OK, so if you could measure how bright something appears, and if you thought you knew its luminosity, that means how, how uh, bright it truly is, that is, it's, how, is it a 100 watt light bulb or something else, then you can infer the distance. Okay, you measure the brightness and the luminosity. You know the luminosity and you measure the distance. If you know the luminosity, we call an object a standard candle. It just means that we know how bright it is, and therefore we can use it to derive distance. Um, you sort of know what this is like if you, if you uh, think about a street, set of street lights. Uh, here's a picture of one. The near ones are bright, and the more distant ones are dimmer, even though they're all more or less the same brightness. So if I, if I measure their brightnesses, I can tell where the lights are situated. Clear? OK, that's how, that's one of the ways we measure um, the, the distance to other galaxies and, and, and to supernovae, which I'll talk about in a moment. OK, this is a little more complicated. To measure the speed with which a galaxy is receding from us, we measure something called the redshift. And to understand redshift, you have to understand spectra. So you are probably familiar with rainbows. The light in this room, which we call white light, actually consists of light of all different wavelengths from red to blue. Red, yellow, green, blue, just like this uh, spectrum on the top. If we have sophisticated instruments, we can measure how much light is, be, is contained in some light bulb or the sun or these lights as a function of their wavelength. And we call that a spectrum. So that's what this is. It's the intensity of light as a function of the wavelength of that light. And the blue curve is just my sketch of what a spectrum might look like. Okay? You might see a lot of light at some wavelengths and a deficit of light at other wavelengths. And these are characteristic of certain atomic transitions for different kinds of atoms. For example, in the sun, there are hundreds and hundreds of these absorption lines caused by atoms in the atmosphere of the sun. Now, why this is important for our story today is because if you look at the light from distant galaxies, it's shifted with respect to uh, the light from our own galaxy. That is, the wavelength at which these lines appear shifts. And it shifts to the red if the galaxy is moving away from us. So um, if I see the same characteristic spectrum, but it's shifted to the red, this distance between the, the, the wavelength change of the light tells me how quickly it's receding. We define something called the red shift, Z. That's a symbol for red shift, which is just the change in the wavelength from where it ought to be locally to where it is in these galaxies, divided by that wavelength. That's called the redshift. And it measures the speed with which 
that galaxy appears to be moving away. Really what it's measuring is the expansion of space. So um, this is called a Doppler shift. How many of you have ever heard of a Doppler shift? OK, so I'm going to show you an example of a Doppler shift, which I found online. OK, let's do this. OK, you heard when the car was coming toward us, you heard it was high-pitched sound. When it was going away, it was a low-pitched sound. I'll do that one more time. Don't do this at home. That shift in the frequency of sound is analogous to the shift in the, frequ the wavelength of light that I'm telling you about. And just to kind of, um, uh, let me just show you a sort of the same kind of thing. But now um, these guys in this, uh, wait, are you playing? Yes, play. All right. We're, uh, we're going to come up this road. When I get the speed that I'm shooting for, I'm going to light on the horn, and you can uh, hear what the effect is. Okay, now here's the, uh, the frequency of the horn. Remember that note. All right. You hear it's higher? Can you hear that? And now it's lower. Okay. What I like about that video is you hear the horn when it's not moving. So you can hear that it's in the middle, right? When it comes towards you, it's shifted to higher frequency. When it goes away, it's shifted to lower frequency. Light does the same thing. When it's coming toward us, we say it's blue shifted because it's shifted to higher frequency uh, or shorter wavelengths. And when it's moving away from us, we say it's red shifted because it's shifted to longer wavelengths or uh, uh, lower frequency. Okay, let's go back to our slide. OK. OK, so 100 years ago, this guy, Vesto Slifer, uh, unfortunate man uh, name-wise, but otherwise pretty clever, observed a bunch of galaxies. And he, he was observing the galaxies in our neighborhood. And he observed that most of them are moving away from us. Okay, So if a galaxy is, let's just look at this galaxy. If this galaxy is moving away from us, then we'll see its spectrum shifted to longer wavelengths. Okay? That's how he could tell. I mean, he measured the longer wavelength. And if it's moving toward us, then we'll see it shifted to shorter wavelength, a blue shift. And he was able to say that out of the 30 or so galaxies nearby, almost every one of them was moving away. One or two were moving toward us. Now, this was very disconcerting. Imagine, who wants to be the center of the universe? I need somebody in the middle to raise their hand. OK, you can be the center of the universe. Imagine that everybody takes a big step away from you. You would feel special, but not in a good way, right? It's like, um, why are you the center of the universe? I mean, we live on Earth. Earth's an ordinary planet around an ordinary star in an ordinary galaxy. Why should everybody be moving away from us? It, it seemed for a moment to imply that we were special. And this harked back to um, the pre-Copernican days when we used to think we were the center of the universe. And then we figured out that the sun was the, you know, we were going around the sun, not the other way around. And then we realized later the sun's only one star in a big galaxy. And, but now we seem to be moving backwards. <laughs> Galaxies are moving away from us. Why? Well, Hubble was the guy who had the clever idea about this. Um, Hubble said, OK, I know that most galaxies are moving away from us. I also can see that the more distant galaxies are moving away faster. And he had a clever idea that this suggests the universe is expanding. Now, to me, that was not obvious. I don't know how Hubble got it, but to me it was not obvious. So I'm going to explain it to you, OK? That's, uh, that's the Hubble law, speed proportional to distance. Here's his actual plot. This is the speed of galaxies as a function of their distance from us, from the Milky Way galaxy. It's a plot. And you can see the data points are those dark points. And the line just shows you the trend in the data. And that trend describes the Hubble law. The more distant galaxies are moving faster. 
Uh, this is 35,000 kilometers per second. That's pretty fast. It's a pretty huge expansion. OK, here's, here's why this works. I'm making a fake universe here. Imagine that there's an infinite space, and I've made a perfectly regular grid, and at every grid point, I've put a galaxy. This isn't how space really is. Galaxies are kind of random. But OK, I put a galaxy at every grid point. And maybe I'll turn the lights down for this one, too. Um, I've circled some galaxies. So I'm going to pick this one arbitrarily to be the center of the universe, OK? Just for now. Let's look at that galaxy. And I've got three galaxies that are one tick mark away. I've colored them light blue. The galaxies that are two tick marks away are light green. And here's one that's three tick marks away. It's in yellow, OK? Now, just watch what happens when I magically have space expand by 30%. Okay, what happens is every grid point gets, the separation between grid points gets bigger by 30%. And now you, see, oh, sorry, back up, back up, back up, this one. Uh, you see that uh, this distance now is 30% bigger than it was. The galaxies themselves, by the way, don't get bigger. And you can ask me why later. OK, so let's calculate the change in distance between adjacent grid points. So the two nearest points are now separated by 30% more distance than they were. So I'm just going to call the distance d. So it's 1.3d minus 1d is what gives me how much it moved. It moved 0.3d. Everybody got that? I'm going to turn the lights back on. So I can see you when you say yes or no. OK. Um, how about the galaxies that were two grid marks away? Well, now they're 2.6 apart. And they were two, so they move 0.6. And the ones that were three squares apart move 0.9. OK? Now, who knows how you measure speed? Distance? Yeah. What's the answer? Anybody? Distance over time. She's got it. Distance over time. So let's, let's calculate the speed. Each of these galaxies moved that much in the same time. OK? So whatever that time was, let me call that speed v, because v is velocity in physics. And this, the point that was farther apart moves at twice the speed, and then three times the speed. Can you see that? So let me make a plot of this. Let me plot Hubble's law. I plot the speed of the galaxy versus its distance away from the one that I picked to be the center of the universe. And you can see that they make a Hubble law. The speed of recession of galaxies from that one that I picked is proportional to the distance. I could have picked any galaxy in that grid. OK? It didn't have to be the one I picked. I could have picked any other galaxy. And it, too, would have behaved like the galaxy with cooties, OK? Because every galaxy is moving away from every other galaxy. And that's a consequence of the expansion of space. So Hubble, Hubble's idea of the expansion of space fixed the, the problem that we looked special. We aren't special. We're not in any special location. Every galaxy sees every other galaxy moving away from it. Questions about that? Yeah? What kind of equipment is used to measure? So um, at the time, they were using the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson in California. Um, it's a, it, 100 inches is like three meters. It's uh, three, three uh, yards. It's pretty big. Um, and that was the biggest telescope at the time. It's now utterly useless because Mount Wilson is too close to Los Angeles, and the skies are too bright, and you can't do anything there. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate this expansion, because this is a really key concept. Uh, with some volunteers. I need like five or six kids to come up front. Come on up, come on up, come on up, come on up. How are we doing? Go ahead. You can come too. That looks like the right number. Come up and line up here. I want you to hold hands. I want you to get in the middle of this desk, like, like spread out like next to each other. I know, so your like, shoulders are touching. Can you get really close? And let's make sure you're kind of in the middle. Yeah, that's pretty good. OK, this is our current universe. Who wants to be the center of the universe? 
You do. OK, you win. You're going to stay right there, OK? Everybody else is going to move so that you're an arm length away from the person next to you, OK? So stick your arm out and move until you're an arm length away from the person next to you. Keep moving. Let's go. Arms out. Oh, looking good. OK, who moved the farthest away? He moved a lot farther. He was really fast. And you were kind of, you didn't move at all. And you, were, you guys were equally slow, right? Because you didn't have to move so far. But, all, but if space is expanding, then everybody has to move apart from everybody else. Well done. Can we have a round of applause for our demonstration? Thank you. You guys can sit down. Thanks. You can do that at home. That is not a dangerous experiment. OK, Hubble diagram. Um, this is what Hubble did. Um, now I'm going to tell you about modern measurements of the Hubble diagram, for which we use um, lots of different instruments. But Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope is one of them, for example. Um, for some reason, in the modern day, we flip this diagram. So instead of speed versus distance, we plot, sorry, back up. We plot distance versus speed. And remember, speed I measure from the redshift. So I have to take a spectrum of a galaxy. And I measure the distance from the galaxy's brightness. OK. So at this end, it's small redshift. At that end, it's a big redshift. Down here, the objects are bright. Farther up there, they're dim. OK. Um, now, this is a key concept. The expansion of the universe should be slowing down. I'm telling you that. Can anybody imagine why that might be? Yes? OK, but, that, but it could keep going forever if, you, if it did that, right? You have more space, but it could keep going from forever. Is there anything that could be pulling it back? Yes? Gravity. 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 There are a lot of galaxies in the universe. Galaxies exert gravitational force on each other. Actually, each of you is exerting a gravitational force on your neighbor, and on everyone else, actually, and on me. But it's a very weak force. However, if you add 10 billion stars, it gets a bit stronger. Okay? So it's a strong force, gravity. It's very heavy. Gravity should be slowing down the expansion. And in the 1990s, astronomers, astronomers had more or less figured out the whole universe. Now, you know because I told you that they didn't know about dark energy. This is completely untrue, OK? But they thought they'd figured everything out. And the one missing piece was how much mass there was in the universe, how much stuff, how much matter. And they realized that by measuring the rate at which the expansion is slowing down, they could figure out how much matter was in the universe. If the slowing down is very dramatic, then there's a lot of gravity, so there's a lot of matter. If it's not slowing down much at all, then there isn't very much matter. And all they had to do was measure that rate of deceleration of the expansion of the universe. Okay? Do people see that, that the amount of matter, will sl more matter slows it down more? Okay. So here's our Hubble diagram, distance versus speed. If, if this, is, this Hubble law works for a constant speed of expansion. That means in every part of the universe at every time, the expansion is the same. Then you get this straight line. But if the expansion is decelerating, then objects are a little bit closer than they would otherwise be. Okay. Constant expansion, they're going out. But if, if it's slowing down, that very distant galaxy is just a little bit closer. And so it's a little bit brighter. So it's a little bit lower on this axis. Okay? So if I could measure galaxies really far away, I should see that they're slowing down. And they should follow this curve. They should not be a straight line. They should follow this curve. That's what astronomers were trying to measure. And the way they usually plot this, oh yeah, right. Object, objects are closer, and they're brighter, therefore. They usually plot this by detrending it. So they just take out the linear Hubble trend, and they plot how much above or below this line points are. 
Okay? Are they brighter than the uniform expansion, in which case they're below? Or are they, uh, well, okay, this, this is what they expect. They should be below this line. They should be, because uh, the universe is decelerating because of gravity. Okay. Questions on this diagram? This is the key diagram because I'm going to show you some real data that looks like this. Everybody get that? If you're dimmer, you're above the line, so you're too far away. If you're brighter, you're below the line, so you're closer. That's deceleration. Okay, we're ready for the discovery of dark energy. There were two teams who, two teams, uh, actually one team of sort of classical astronomers, one team of sort of physicists slumming in astronomy. Um, uh, that was a joke, because they really, and this, I, I have to show you this picture. I searched for this picture. The teams were not always, shall we say, friendly. Uh, when I worked at the Hubble Telescope Observatory, um, I had to uh, oversee the fights, which were made in proposals. They weren't physical fights. Um, and these two teams were extremely competitive. Um, but it's a good thing they were both doing this experiment. <clears throat> so how did they do the experiment? They used something called a supernova. Anybody know what a supernova is? Yeah. It's when a sun or a star explodes. At the end of its life, uh, it collapses and has a violent explosion and becomes extremely bright for a short period of time. Here is a picture. Oh, yeah, this is another one that's good with no lights. This is a picture of a nearby galaxy with a supernova in it. This is, uh, was, this is a supernova that was, went off in 1994. So um, it's, it's called 1994D. Here's the galaxy here. What you see, this is the light from all the billions of stars in the galaxy. And here's the light of one supernova. It's very, very bright compared to most stars. And you can easily see it. And it turns out that supernovae make pretty good standard candles. Let's, uh, let's see. Here is a galaxy. This is a picture of a galaxy before a supernova goes off. And I'm going to show you what it looks like when the supernova goes off. There's the supernova. It's not hugely bright in this case, but you can certainly see it above the background stellar, stellar light of the galaxy. Let's do that again. There's before. There's after. Before and after. Now, some of you are saying, what are these bright things? Maybe. Maybe you're asking that. These bright things, unfortunately, are stars in our galaxy. They, we have to look through our galaxy to, to look out into space. And so we always get a few stars in the way. That's what those are. But this one that appears and disappears, that's a supernova. OK, we can measure the brightness of the supernova. And since it's a standard candle, we know the distance to it. We can also measure its spectrum. And we can measure its redshift from the spectrum. I'm going to show you this movie, which uh, has three parts, three things going on at once. There's an image here. The supernova goes off about there. You'll see it get brighter and then dimmer. As it gets brighter than dimmer, you'll see this dot will show you how bright it is on a light curve. A light curve is the intensity as a function of time. So as time goes on, the dot will move down here. And at the same time, you'll see a movie of the spectrum. The spectrum is here, and you'll see how it changes in time. So let's do this. Here's the supernova going off and now getting dimmer. Um, and that took a couple of weeks. That's like a three or four week. Uh, movie, condensed for your convenience. Let's do it one more time. There it is getting brighter and dimmer. You see the spectrum. You see the light curve. Remember from the light curve from this, we're getting the distance because it's, it, this is saying how bright it is. And I want you to watch the spectrum this time to see the, the absorption lines, to see the spectral lines. You see all these peaks and valleys? Those are what we're measuring to get the redshift. Okay. <coughs> OK, so both teams decided to look for supernovae of a certain kind that were standard candles and to measure the expansion of the universe and how it's decelerating. They um, used Hubble to do this. There's a big advantage to being in space. Let me show you that. On the left is an image taken from a picture taken from a ground-based telescope in very good conditions. 
So about the best resolution you can get from the ground, well, not the best, but close, it's good. So this is good resolution. And this is the sharper picture that you can take from the Hubble Space Telescope. And here, you can clearly see this is a galaxy, and that's a supernova that went off in the galaxy. And you can clearly separate them, and you can measure the supernova brightness, which is what you need. Whereas here, it's a little hard to see that there's something over there. It's hard to pull it out. So Hubble was really essential to this effort. OK, this is the experiment we're going to do. We find standard candles, these supernovae. They're called type 1a supernovae. They're a particular kind. We observe how bright they are to get the distance to that supernova, which of course is in a galaxy, which measures uh, space. And we measure its redshift to get the speed. And then we plot the Hubble diagram. And then we measure the deceleration. And we get the mass in the universe. Easy. It took about five years to get enough data. A big team, two big teams working for five years. And as I've telegraphed, they didn't get the answer they expected. Remember, this is what you expect. You expect to see objects being brighter than the constant expansion line. And here's their data. The blue line is the constant expansion line. This is redshift. This is brightness, distance. So you can see, sure enough, Hubble law and as you go to bigger and bigger distances, you're supposed to be going down here. Oops, it's up here. Objects are dimmer than they should have been. So both teams were highly distressed. <laughs> um, graduate students were calculating over and over again, trying to see what they did wrong. Maybe the calibrations were wrong. Maybe they made a mistake somewhere. Because this couldn't be true. Now, there are some reasons you could make up why it might be true. Maybe, um, maybe there's some screen in front of those supernovae that kind of makes them dimmer. But really, what happened was uh, both teams talked to each other. And they found out the other guys were having the same problem. Okay? Actually, to be honest, one of the teams, I won't tell you which one, one of them actually gave a paper at a meeting saying the universe was decelerating and giving a measurement because they didn't really believe their result. And they, they had some points that were down here. These are bins. So they kind of fudged it. Um, but then they got more data, and it was like more obvious. So they compared notes. And with independent data, like one team was looking at those supernovae, and another team was looking at some other supernovae. So they had independent data for the most part. They found the same result. And what they concluded was that the expansion of the universe is not decelerating. It's accelerating. It's speeding up so that galaxies are farther away from us than they would be in a, in a constant expansion. Um, 1998, this was announced. Uh, I think I have the, oh yeah, right, they're too faint, accelerating. There you go. Science Magazine put this on their cover saying this was the breakthrough, scientific breakthrough of the year. Um, it was utterly unexpected. People didn't really believe it at first, I have to say. They, they thought there must be some other explanation. But within a, year, within a year or two, there were confirmations from, um, let me back up a slide. Yeah, let me, let me point something out. There were, there were actually confirmations. So this red line is what you expect if there's a force pushing galaxies apart. Okay? And you expect, you expect an acceleration which would go this way. How to say this? OK, when the universe started its expansion, it was quite small. Gravity is a force that's stronger when particles or galaxies are close together. So when the universe started its expansion, in fact, gravity was stronger than this new force, which I'm going to call dark energy. And I'll tell you why in a minute why we call it that. So when the expansion first started, it actually was slowing down. But as the universe got bigger, the gravity force between galaxies, of course, got weaker because they're farther apart. So the dark energy force seems to be pretty constant in time. So at some moment, which is about 5 billion years ago, uh, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. So about 5 billion years ago, dark energy started winning. And right now, today, in our universe, at this time, 
uh, ex the expansion is accelerating. And so here's the critical point. If the supernova were too faint for some other reason, having to do with, you know, they were formed earlier in the universe or something, then you should expect to see this black line, where as you go farther away, they just get dimmer and dimmer. But if it indeed there is some kind of dark energy, then you expect this expansion uh, to have been decelerating at some point, so it would fall below the constant rate line at very large distances, very large redshifts, very large um, speeds. And this is what was seen. In fact, points were seen over here, and that absolutely clinched it. You can't explain it by uh, all the reasons people were giving. It had to be some kind of new stuff, new force that was pushing space apart. This is pretty radical. Um, you grew up learning maybe about gravity. Maybe you learned about electricity and magnetism. If you took physics, advanced physics, you might have learned about the weak force and the strong force. We've known about those for ah, almost 100 years. This is something new. And in 2001, uh, the uh, new NASA spacecraft called WMAP measured how much of this stuff there was, and it's most of the universe. I should explain um, about Einstein's blunder. So Einstein, of course, he, he came up with his theory of gravity uh, also 100 years ago, in the 19-teens. And at that time, astronomers hadn't yet, Hubble hadn't yet had his insight that the universe was expanding. Astronomers thought the universe was completely static. Now this was dumb, we now realize, because it, you know, physics would have told us otherwise. And, and Einstein realized that if you had a static universe with galaxies everywhere, it should be contracting because of gravity. But his astronomers told him it was not contracting. So he thought, and he scratched his head, he said, gee, my equations say gravity should be making it fall in. Uh, but, but they tell me it's not, so I need another force pushing out. So he put a number in his equation, he put a constant called lambda, capital Greek letter lambda, into his equations to oppose gravity so that the universe could be static. Now when Hubble said the universe is expanding, then Einstein said, oh, I was completely wrong, because if the universe is expanding, it can be slowing down, okay? But, but, it, but Einstein's laws work great without the constant, without the <coughs> lambda. So he said, that was just stupid that I put that in my equations, and I should never have done it. He called it his greatest blunder. Actually, he didn't say that. Gamow said that. Gamow said, you know, Einstein was talking to me, and he said, this was my greatest blunder. Uh, but now, in 1998, this stuff, this dark energy, behaves exactly like Einstein's lambda. Very annoying, because it was, not a, it was not a good suggestion to have a lambda. But now people have found it. Okay, that's a little, you can, you can think what you want about that. <laughs> Let me skip this. I can come back if you're interested. What causes this acceleration? As I told you, we call it dark energy. Let me explain the term dark. Well, energy. Let me do energy first. Energy because it's causing something to push out. Okay, that's why it's called energy. It's sort of opposite of gravity in a way. Dark in astronomy, in physics, means we don't know what it is. Okay? Dark energy means we don't see it. We see its effects. It's dark to us, but we see its effects in the Hubble plot that I showed you. Some of you have heard of dark matter as well. It's, it's different. Dark matter is extra stuff we don't see that causes positive gravity. The only thing they share is that word dark, and dark means we don't know what it is, okay? They do opposite things. Dark matter pulls in, dark energy pushes out. Okay, what is it? Don't know. Uh, how much is there? We do know that. It's three quarters of the universe. What causes it? No idea. How does it behave? We're working on it. <laughs> we are doing experiments now to map the expansion history of the universe and to try to see if the strength of dark energy has changed over time and how much. And that tells us something about where it comes from. 
For those of you who have had physics, you can think of it as a sort of potential energy, um, much like the inflation potential that caused the initial expansion of the universe. OK, here's our pie chart of the universe. Three quarters dark energy, unknown before 1998. Astronomers solving the last final problem discover something, basically discover they hadn't known anything before. In your class, your science class, it's probably bad to discover something you didn't know before. <laughs> because you're supposed to, you know, write down the right answer on the test. But in science, this is actually fabulous. If you find that you are wrong, what it means is you learn something new. And what we learn is really interesting. There's this whole other force out there that we didn't know about. And it's most of the universe. Um, we are made of what I call normal matter, this stuff. Sometimes you hear the term baryonic matter. That's protons, neutrons, atoms, like in the periodic table, which there probably should be one in this building. Ah, it's behind the screen. That's normal matter. We're made of a lot of water, a lot of carbon. So there's hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, some other stuff, phosphorus, nitrogen, things you're familiar with. That's a tiny fraction. The, everything except hydrogen helium we call heavy elements. That's 0.03% of the universe. So what we're made of, what the Earth is made of, everything we know how to measure in the laboratory and play with at demonstrations, that stuff is negligibly present in our universe. Most of it's dark energy. A great deal of it is something called dark matter. I explained to you that that's, those are particles that interact. They, ha they have gravity. They cause gravity. They cause galaxies to stick together, and, and um, they do pull on each other. Uh, but we don't know what it's made of. It's some particle that is not described by our current laws of physics. Um, there are some ideas about what it might be. If you've heard of the Large Hadron Collider, uh, they might be uh, studying it, but we don't know yet what it is. OK, I'm going to skip this, and I'm just going to end. Uh, you can ask me about geometry later. Um, I just want to end with a few words about what are we going to do. So the first thing is, what's the fate of the universe? We don't know. Okay? It used to be pretty easy. You could just measure how much mass was in it, and that would tell you whether it was going to expand forever or turn around and fall back in. Not easy anymore, because now we have two effects. We have gravity pulling in, we have dark energy pushing out, and we don't know which is going to win. So this cartoon kind of gives you some, um, some of the theories that are out there. Uh, we don't know what's correct. Uh, it, it, the universe could expand forever, it, it, and we could end up a sort of cold, dark universe where most of us are living inside black holes. It could, if um, dark energy goes away in time, you could end up with gravity pulling everything back in. Or if dark energy gets stronger, it could rip apart galaxies and stars and eventually anybody. We don't know which it is. We're going to go to telescopes and look. Here's, here's just a few. This is the Wynn telescope in um, Arizona. You can visit it if you're out at Kitt Peak near uh, Tucson. Uh, this, is, this is a telescope that Yale uh, owns part of. That's the Y, that's Yale. Uh, Wisconsin, Indiana, Yale, and the National Optical Astronomy Observatories. We were actually the last partner. They had a nice acronym. It was W-I-N, WIN. And we were the last, so we should go on the ends, but then we'd be whiny. So we put ourselves here. <laughs> we also, uh, Yale also has a part of the Keck telescopes, which are on Mauna Kea and on the Big Island in Hawaii. And what you're looking at here are the two telescope domes for the Keck, and behind is a Japanese telescope called Super, Subaru. Hawaii can be kind of wet. It rains. There are clouds. But the clouds are below the top of the mountain. So you can go to Hawaii. It can be pouring rain, and the astronomers are observing. It's really fun. I was there a few weeks ago doing that. Um, this is the end of my talk. It's not the end of the story. There's a huge thing to discover and understand. And what's really amazing to me is just a few astronomers using a few telescopes and getting a few bits of light from distant galaxies can figure this out, can figure out billions of years of cosmic history. And I, I invite you younger people to learn more about this. 
uh, when you uh, get back to your classes. Thank you.